far as our webinar for today, we have Rusty Lloyd. He's the executive director of Rivers Edge West. And we have Lisa Tasker, who's a botanist, ecologist with the Colorado Natural, Natural Heritage Program. And they are both here to talk with us today about planning and implementation considerations uh, to assist land managers and landowners with on the ground restoration efforts. Uh, so our format for today, Rusty is gonna kick off the webinar for 20 minutes. Uh, Lisa's gonna follow with another 20 minute presentation and then we're gonna follow up with the 20 minute Q&A session at the end. So uh, again, thanks for joining us. And with that, I will kick it over to Rusty. All right, thanks Shannon. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We wanted to provide uh, some restoration resources for people who uh, uh, venture into the endeavor of riparian restoration. Um, things to consider as far as planning, uh, things to think about on the front end uh, and the back end, and then some of the steps in between. I want to caveat my presentation before we start that, that we only have a limited amount of time and there are many different types of steps and, and lots of processes that go into uh, the restoration process. We will touch on a few. We'll touch on a few of them, but we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, you know, we 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 do uh, we do want to highlight the importance of all the phases of restoration. However, we know we're we're limited on time, and we will be having more uh, webinars that touch on some of those uh, some of those aspects of restoration. So a little bit about us. Uh, again, I'm Rusty Lloyd. I'm the executive director of Rivers Edge West. Appreciate you being with us today. Uh, Rivers Edge West is a uh, small medium nonprofit located in Grand Junction, Colorado. Our mission is really to advance uh, the restoration of riparian areas through collaboration, education, and technical assistance. We want to assist people with, with uh, improving the health of their riparian lands, whatever those may be. It could be a landowner, it could be a land manager, uh, it could be a municipality. We try to help people accomplish their goals uh, and, and, and collaborate with, with others to do this work. So uh, a little bit to start off with is, you know, uh, what's the problem? Uh, well, that's, that's kind of a loaded question, but generally speaking, our organization works on the problem of riparian areas impacted by invasive plant species. Um, you know, in, in the arid west, uh, we, we, we are impacted. Uh, by invasive plant species, and and this is just one. Uh, this is just one of the, uh, I think, um, one of the pieces of information that that just just a little bit startling is is that tamarisk and Russian olive comprise the third and fourth most commonly found riparian plants in the southwest, meaning our 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 rivers and riparian areas are greatly impacted by invasive plant species. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, but but I think we're here today because most of you, if not all of you, have chosen to address some of these issues and, and take on some of these issues as far as invasive plant species and impacting uh, our riparian health and our, our river health. Um, sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide here. Bear with me. Okay. Um, the reason why we do this, and and the reason mainly uh, most of our communities are, are are thriving in the West is because we live along these areas. We have uh, we have rivers that we uh, we produce agriculture off of. We we utilize for wildlife habitat. Um, but the impact of invasive species are are, are quite um, again, quite startling. Uh, riparian areas comprise about one to two percent of all, uh, all all of the land in, in the West. Uh, eighty percent, nearly eighty percent of all uh, animal species use the riparian area and corridor at some phase or or life cycle in their life cycle, and, and so that constitutes a, a really critical. Um, a really critical resource that is uh, needs to be uh, taken care of, and and so uh, because of invasive plants, uh, uh, you know, encroaching in these areas, 
some of this natural riparian habitat has been lost. And what we want to do is we want to not turn back time to where, you know, pre-European settlement, but we want to uh, we want to help these areas along as, as much as we can to make sure that they are here for uh, our current uses and here for uh, the future generations. So what do we want? Um, I think generally speaking, we want a, uh, a stratified riparian area where we have uh, grasses and forbs, we want uh, understory, uh, shrubs, uh, we want overstory, uh, you know, um, trees. So, you know, that's, that's generally, uh, you know, not to be altruistic, but, you know, we want to have uh, a diverse riparian area that can, that can serve uh, the many purposes that we rely on our rivers for. With that, um, you know, uh, as we talked, in, in invasive riparian species tend to be uh, the name of the game. Uh, we have lots and lots of them. These are just these are just a handful that I I chose to pick out. But you know we have invasive woody plants. Uh, we have herbaceous plants, uh, not only in our riparian areas but 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 all over. Uh, but these are the these are uh, tend to be some of the the problem childs. You know we want to we want to see if we can uh, address these issues. When we look at our site, you know. Uh, I think it's 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 you have to think about what we want. Now remember, removal of invasive plants is not a goal. It it, it may be uh, it may be one step in the process, but what do we want? If you have something that's on the left, and we want to get to somewhere on the right, the removal is just one step in that process. And I think that's what we want to really take into account is is are those factors what what are my goals do we want uh you want wildlife habitat do we want uh just just more diversity uh is it is it agricultural production um what and so those are the those are the the considerations to take into account but when we start thinking about what we want we have to look at the lifespan or the 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 cycle of restoration it's not going in and just tearing out a plant and planting another one and, and hoping for the best. Um, sometimes that happens, but, but we, we, we want to make sure that we can utilize uh, tactics and strategies that will save us money and, and, and hopefully get, get to our goals. And so generally speaking, our organization likes to, likes to at least hone in on these five steps. These may not be uh, comprehensively the only steps, but I think these are the ones that you need to really consider uh, for making your, your project a success. Um, obviously planning and fundraising, starting out with what you wanna do and trying to raise money for it. After that, you, you dive into implementation of, of you know, invasive plant uh, treatments, native plant restoration, and then you have to look back at what worked and what didn't. And then how are you going to steward uh, these lands for the long term? So looking at the, the planning and fundraising, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to hone in too long on the fundraising, but it is an, a very critical component. I, I think it's important that people try to look at, at a landscape scale if possible. Now, I know that if a private landowner is kind of working within their, their property, you know, landscape scale is is relative, but but I think if you can look at the components of, of the of the land and how they interact, I think you're going to be better off rather than you know, I think parsing each of those out, working on them separately, and not looking at the, at the whole uh, at the project as a whole or the landscape as a whole. How how are those how do those resources interact? Um, second. We, we can't do this alone. No, no government, federal, state, local government, no nonprofit uh, can really do this work alone. So, you know, we've, we've found a lot of success collaborating with, with many different partners. And, and that could be a, a landowner that, that talks with a, a, a state a wildlife agency or bringing in a nonprofit partner that could help them access funding. Or you know, you know, relying on 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 partners that can really bring in expertise 
and 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 horsepower that can get can get these projects uh, on track and, and can get them done. Connected with that is is looking at what other local and regional uh, initiatives are, are happening. Sometimes uh, you can benefit uh, by by connecting with other initiatives. Sometimes we package these these uh, projects and and propose them to funders because uh, these projects are are related and, and the initiatives uh, are complementary to each other. So. You know, I think it's it, it's good to look up and and see what other what other initiatives that can benefit your your project. Do that if you if you're kind of working through, you know, should we do this? Should we not do this? Is is really understanding the threats to your river system? Um, obviously, invasive invasive plant species and weeds are are, are a problem. You know, what can be addressed and what cannot be addressed. A lot of our river systems are regulated, highly regulated, and 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 flows are are are, are augmented. And so, can can you address that? Well, probably not. But but find out what you can address within within the system, um, and, and and that may be where you can link up to those other related initiatives to get more information about what's happening on your river system or your stretch of the river. Uh, you know, knowing the flows. Uh, is, is important to to planting, knowing pH and salinity. You know, a, a lot of those things. Uh, knowing your river system is, is really important. You know, ultimately, um, you know, one of the most important, I think, aspects to this is making sure that setting goal strategies, tactics, and metrics uh, are 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 really at the forefront uh, of, of everybody's mind when they go into this work. And and we'll get to that here in a little bit. And ultimately, raising funds. If you if you chosen to kind of move forward, you've thought through the do's and don'ts. Uh, you you do need to think about uh, funding and, and and diverse fund streams. This may be where you can link up with other partners, where nonprofits can help land managers or landowners uh, link up with with diverse fund streams. Maybe it's connecting with a watershed partnership uh, that's already doing work out there. And, and there's multiple fiscal agents that, that land managers and landowners can, can, can benefit from. And, and to that end, funding needed for all phases of implementation, reveg, monitoring, maintenance, and stewardship needs to be thought out. It's true, you probably can't think of where every dollar might come from, but you need to start planning for those phases. Um, we we don't want a one and done project. We want to make sure that we can uh, we can have these uh, projects being the most impactful for the longest amount of time. So moving on, um, when we when we look at um, moving into planning, you know I, I wish there was a silver bullet, but the, but there is not. Um, a one size fits all approach is is really difficult because there's uh, there's nuances and contextual. Uh, um, uh, information uh, connected with different stretches of river, and so making sure uh, that 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 the planning is working from you. I think you can learn the lessons from what other people have have done, but making sure that your your goals, objectives, and metrics are clearly defined, and ample time has been spent thinking through those. What is the end goal, and and how do we get there? You know, how much is it going to cost, and, and the time frame. When we talk about planning, I, I think flexibility and creativity are are, are essential. Um, you know, not many things can can can, you know, are are good from being rigid. So I think making sure of, of keeping an open mind and and learning the lessons from other planning efforts are are really critical and and really can save you uh, save you money and, and time over the course of a, a project and then um, you know when we talk about planning I, I alluded to it earlier the, the, the transition and phases that you're going to go through um, how are all those playing into the to the end goal of what you want for your stretch of the river or what you're managing for you know there will be 
um, transitions or will be impacts or will be phases. You know, if, if you're, uh, you know, if you're working with partners, these partners will come and go. How do these things impact uh, your ultimate goals? So, you know, planning, I think, is, is one of the key things that we need to, to look at as we do restoration. Um, quickly, I just want to say that we have far more planning resources on our website. Uh, if you go to our resource center, uh, you can click on the, the, the left hand um, list and you can look at planning and development resources, you can look at implementation, you can look at uh, scientific literature that can really inform uh, the, the science behind your project. Uh, we do want to base these projects off, off of the best science and, and state of the science as possible. So we encourage you to seek out uh, what resources you can to inform your project to save you time and money. Here's one of them. It's on our website. Uh, this is not all just our information. It's a lot of our partners' information and our researchers' information. So go check that out. It can really help uh, with your project. Uh, thinking through. Um, um, the questions you need to ask yourself. Obviously, if we're to this point, we're, we're thinking about uh, doing restoration. Um, just some general questions. Who's going to do it? Can you do it? Can, do you need a partner? Do you need a contractor? You know, there's, there's youth corps that employ young adults uh, around the region that, that are very, very good resources for restoration. What are the tactics going to be used? What are the techniques? The removal, the biomass, the maintenance. How long will it take? Um, you know, this. Our rivers didn't get this way overnight. It's going to take them a while to get back to where we want them to be. Um, so, how long is your time frame? And then ultimately, what the costs are. One of the thing about costs is we we uh, want to give people a leg up to start the planning process. Uh, we created a riparian restoration cost calculator where you can put in the criteria um, and, and, and it spits out um, some costs that are based on, on restoration that has been done over the last 20 years. Uh, we've been updating this cost calculator periodically. It's located on our website and, and, and it's, it's, it's really a handy tool where you can say, wow, I, I don't even know how much this would even cost me to get started on this. Well, this could be a starting place. You probably need to, you know, this needs to be ground truth with what actual the costs are out there with contractors and, and youth cores and what your materials are. But the cool thing is it does assume some things. Like if you're going to remove tamarisk or Russian olive, you're going to need some money for resprout control. Or if you are going to uh, do reveg, um, you need to have uh, you know these costs involved with you know replacement because you know not 100% of your plants are going to live. And so at least gets you uh, uh, going down the road of hey you know this can be done um, for this amount of money. Uh, over this amount of time. So again, the website is right there, the link to this cost calculator. When we're, uh, when we're looking at uh, implementation, okay, we've, we've gone through the, the questions we've asked ourselves about, should we do this? Can we do this if we want to? Um, we're at the point where, hey, we're gonna move forward. Uh, the decision to uh, control invasive plants, you know, we stress that utilizing integrated pest management and, and really it's, 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 it's using all the tools in your toolbox to make sure that you can reduce ecological and economic impacts, not only from the costs of the project, but ecological and impacts to your, uh, maybe it's your, your ranch or your farm, or maybe it's, it's your stretch of the river as a land manager, is, is, you know, how can we use the least amount of herbicide with the most effective uh, control measures? Uh, how, how do we have to eradicate or can kill every single bad plant? Or is there a threshold that we can live with where, uh, you know, there's 95% uh, diversity of native plants, but 5% invasive? I think thinking through those. And the four steps really is, is setting those thresholds that we just talked about. IDing what, what is there and, and monitoring how that's interacting on your, your, 
your stretch of the river, prevention and control. Um, and then with that, you know, there are some very, uh, very useful new technologies. And, and I think that there will continue to see a great, um, a great host of, of technologies that can save people time and money. Many of you are probably already using them like drones for monitoring or, uh, you know, there's lots of things that are coming out now. And, and I stress that you should look into those technologies or partners that can help you access those technologies definitely save you time and money in the long run. When we get to actually controlling, uh, these are really the methods that, uh, that we're talking about, and, and there's much more information on each of these on the, uh, at, at our resource center at that link that I, I gave you guys earlier. Um, uh, mechanical, chemical, hand control, biological, and you know, I, I'm a little nervous uh, uh, suggesting fire in the time of, uh, you know, Colorado and some of the West is on fire right now, but, but prescribed fire can be a, a part of, of, of the control options and part of the restoration. One of the, you know, one of the things is we need to make sure that we use the right tool for the right project. And when we look at removal options, mechanical and heavy equipment is definitely a a tool that we can use in, in certain areas. There are definitely pros and cons to each one of these, but when I say using the correct tool for the correct um, correct project is, you know, maybe if you're removing 50 acres of tamarisk or Russian olive and, and it's easy access, maybe it's more cost effective to use uh, mechanical means than hand labor, uh, just because of the costs. Um, and you can see some of the pros and cons here is making sure that you select the tool that is right for your project and keeping uh, IPM integrated pest management in your mind is maybe it's not just one tool, but it's a combination of three. Some other mechanical removal options that have uh, that have uh, um, pros and cons is you can you can do extraction you can use heavy machinery to kind of pluck a, a woody tree out um, there there are benefits to that however it does create a lot of biomass so you know biomass management is a is a very um, uh, is, is definitely something you need to consider when you're going into some of these uh, these projects and then mastication and mulching um, obviously you know um, putting biomass on the ground could uh, could be good. Too much of it might not be good. Could impact uh, right revegetation efforts. So some things to keep in in consideration. Many times on our uh, removal projects, we look at uh, what labor can be used. Hand labor, um, using chainsaws. You know, more of a surgical method. Low impact to soil and disturbance to site. However, costs. Uh, are, are a consideration. Um, labor labor does continue to uh, labor costs do continue to rise. So these are again the considerations to think about. And when you look at these hand crews, uh, it you know there could be other benefits. So not only can they accomplish you know just physically removal of of some of these uh, plant species. Uh, they can be utilized in remote areas where heavy machinery cannot access. Maybe there's wilderness considerations. Um, you know, crews can hike in. And also, you know, some of these crews can, can accomplish uh, social, cultural, and economic goals where conservation corps have been um, engaging with tribal, uh, tribal youth and, and veterans uh, to, to um, engage those uh, demographics into riparian restoration. So some other considerations to look at when we're when we're doing restoration. Other options might be uh, is looking at, at, at more low tech uh, or, or, or more cost effective ways to control some of these plant species is is girdling and 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 trying to control uh, the plant uh, that way. This is Good technique for some species like Russian olive, elm, some others. You know, tamarisk is tough because it has multiple trunks, and so it would take a 
very long time to girdle them. But this may be a low cost option for people uh, is, is when we're uh, when time is on their side, you know, you can start controlling Russian olive and and and, and maybe you want to leave it for vertical structure for raptors or, or something like that. These girdling methods could be used to at least start um, start controlling invasive species. Some other methods that you can kind of mix in here is a hack and squirt method where uh, you know some of these techniques are used in in the very back country or if there's uh, not a lot of funding for heavy equipment or or um, or hand crews you can do hack and squirt and frill cut methods where uh, you, you're you're really slowly killing the tree um, you know you, you don't have to really do anything with a biomass these can be very good in a backcountry setting and very um, cost effective definitely slower and, and and takes a lot longer to kind of move the needle back towards a native composition but you know again these are these are techniques that can be used we've also found some other techniques where uh, we've used 50-50 uh, treatment where we've removed 50% of the invasive uh, biomass and, and, and left 50% of it. it. It allows that microclimate and humidity uh, for uh, uh, native re-sprouts and revegetation opens up some sunlight. It can clear corridors where you can treat other, uh, other invasive species. And, and so we've seen some success with other uh, mixed treatments and alternatives like this. Uh, and if you want more information about this, we can uh, we can give you that. One of the things you really need to consider when you're when you are looking into these things is biomass management. As you can see in this picture, uh, this is a tamarisk tree we found along along the Gila. Um, you know, you cut that thing down; it's massive. Uh, what are you going to do with all that? Uh, are you going to slash pile it? Um, you know, that, that may be one. Can you chip it? There's costs involved with that. Burning, uh, burning piles, maybe, maybe not, you know, depends on. And hauling off, yes, could be an option, but it is, is costly. So thinking through how biomass, uh, you know, when you remove these plants, uh, you know, what are you going to do with that, with that actual uh, leftovers? And then looking at you know many of our um, many of our treatments that we have to do is 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 we do utilize herbicide controls. We try to use it in, um, with the most effective way possible. Here are some things to consider. Um, many of you have either tried these, but uh, we have a lot more information about each of these techniques on our website. Uh, cut stump, cutting a tree down and spraying the the trunk. Foliar application. There's pluses and minuses about that can use a lot more herbicide, could impact soil uh, for revegetation. We utilize basal bark treatment quite often. Uh, it could be a great retreatment technique. So if you remove uh, uh, you know, some acreage, there will be re-sprouts. Basal bark treatments are good, uh, good retreatment techniques, uh, cost effective. Aerial spraying uh, is very specific uh, to very certain types of stands um you know it's 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 a rarity that is it's used these days but sometimes uh it can be used the technology has gotten uh to the point where they are they're very accurate with some of their spray but again um costly and 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 usually used on massive stands of uh, invasive species lastly biological control um, there are many biological controls out there for different plant species uh, we suggest that you consult with your local experts usda ag departments state ag departments county extensions on what um, biocontrols are available um, there there are many and so uh, depending on the species that you're looking at this may be uh, a way to start uh, start uh, chipping away at some of those invasive species so it could be something that you look at, into uh, for your piece of ground uh, i'm going to uh, kind of move this along wrap this up i'm not going to spend a lot of time on revegetation it is a critical important uh, part of the restoration uh, life cycle but lisa is here to talk more about that but the, the overall message i want to hit is is think about this early uh, 
how much do you need? Where are you going to get it? And is the right plant stock right for my site? Uh, if it was grown in high elevation Oregon, is it going to grow very well in low elevation uh, arid southwest uh, Colorado? Those are things to keep in mind. Um, and then determining whether your system can actually uh, passively reveg or if it needs help. I think those are the, the crossroads that many of us come to to, to see if, if, uh, if actions are needed. And that's where the monitoring really comes in. So we have a YouTube channel that actually demonstrates a lot of the monitoring efforts, a lot of the planting of cottonwoods and willows uh, that, that actually walks through a lot of the steps that can uh, save you time and money. So if you guys want, check out our uh, our YouTube. The Tamaris Coalition is our old name. Uh, many of you may know us by our old name, the Tamaris Coalition. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of uh, a lot of videos that that kind of walk through a lot of the things that we've talked about today. And then quickly, evaluation and monitoring. Um, these will be other webinars we'll have. Uh, um, following these is it, it's a must do though you have to ask yourself what strategies i used did it work how much did it cost me and did it get me to my goals you 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 have to have that evaluation and monitoring piece with the restoration to know uh um how you're doing and and so you can be adaptive and flexible and creative with your restoration and, and your funding um, we have very limited funding to do this, and, and we need to be the most uh, efficient and effective possible. And this, this is really where it tells you how to do that. And then the consideration for how these uh, lands will be steward, stewarded in, in the future. I think private lands versus public lands is very different. There may be more community engagement or volunteerism that can help with public land stewardship. But private lands may use some of those tactics as well. Uh, maybe they have already thought through a long-term stewardship plan, but I think the long-term game is, is what we're trying to keep our eye on. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for joining us, and uh, I'll turn it over to Lisa. All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, welcome, everyone. And um, yes, I'm Lisa Tasker, and I am with the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. Um, and I really want to thank Rusty for inviting us to to sort of come in today and um, and present a little bit regarding the native plant side and and a little bit of the planning side for um, a restoration project. And Rusty really um, laid out the multiple facets of restoration. Um, uh, very succinctly and very clearly and covered a lot of ground. Um, I, I'm very impressed, like a true sage. So, um, so uh, here's my, um, this is my email address for later on if you guys have any questions about anything. Um, all right, so um, I just kind of I wanted to start off with this. This is this is kind of this is maybe reflects what happens with me when I'm involved with the restoration project. So <laughs> uh, we do we get we're, we're always very excited um, and uh, very passionate, and then obviously we need to bring in a whole lot of other experts and stakeholders and collaborators and partners and um, make sure that we can really dial down on its success. So um, so the first thing I'm going to cover is planning. And I just really want to emphasize how much planning is so important. We often end up getting involved in projects without as much planning as we like um, for various reasons. We may be um, part of an organization that decides to do a volunteer day and we just um, we're, we're short on resources, we're short on people. There's um, just a lot of reasons. Um, we also could be under the uh, under the auspices of a grant where you know you have your grant money coming in and you need to spend it at a certain amount of time and so you just you end up 
just having a lot less planning than you than you expected to do. And frankly, when you get to the native plants part of it, for native plants, you really have got to have at least two years in advance if you really want to get um, plants that you are targeting, um, the native plants that are hopefully more ecotypically appropriate. Um, and if you want to connect with with a um, nursery and have them do any kind of growing out of any seed collection, that obviously takes sometimes three to five years. So there's um, planning, planning, planning is, is definitely um, the most important thing you can do. And, 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 and Rusty touched on this too. He really talked about how you need to think about your, your end game um, while you're planning and and i also want to talk about you want to think about your ongoing stewardship and then also you know monitoring is going to be a part of this so that you can have a feedback loop into understanding how you alter your processes and i rusty said the other day let's let's try and talk about how we can say you know you can't do a restoration project when you're one and done you just you can't do it and and oftentimes I've been involved in a number of restoration projects in the last 25 years, not too many, but where it is oftentimes one and done. But I think uh, we're moving past that immensely. I think, you know, there are so many people who have been engaged in restoration now that we definitely have um, tried really hard to get way past that. But and then, of course, you want to evaluate your progress, like I was saying, so that you can continue to to um, alter your plans as you go forward. So, and lastly, I, I think, again, you need to really define what, what does success look like for you um, in your specific project. Every, every project is so site specific. It's every project is so unique. And again, that's back to planning. And in your planning, you know, you need to talk about what, what, what would you like this to look like? Define what that's gonna mean and then figure out how to um, implement strategies to get to that. So um, here is just a little bit of an example um, I want to just bring up. This is a heritage program project that happened recently. And you know we're very fortunate. Um, it's, I, I like to use some um, real case study, uh, you know, um, ideas so we were able to engage the public a little bit on this and students and interns and have a bio blitz and i probably i probably understand that a lot of you understand what a bio blitz is but and we also were able to you know do vegetation transects ahead of time so that's that kind of feeds into the the monitoring part where you actually have some baseline information on your project if you're able to afford to do anything like that or you know get some some group involved with helping you to do that that might be interested in that that could play into some sort of research that they're doing um, so and of course you want to try and if you can look at the hydrologic regime when you're doing your planning and the other part of it is do you have what is irrigation what's your irrigation plan that's really important that's also kind of connected to understanding your hydrology because uh, if you have any possibility for any kind of short-term irrigation or not you know that obviously is going to really play into your planning so what i want to talk about is online resources and obviously rusty has gone over how rivers edge west is just has a plethora of information it is absolutely fantastic and um, i use it quite often in the projects that i do and they're constantly getting new things that are that come up on their website and there's they stay relevant and it's just incredibly helpful but i also would like to i'm going to focus a lot on the colorado national heritage program we have the colorado wetland information center and this is another really powerful website and we're trying to get more and more funding so we can we can actually keep adding to it 
but I'm going to focus on that. And then the other part is the Society for Ecological Rest Restoration. I want to call them out. That's also another um, great group. And I don't know if um, how many of you are familiar, but there's also a chapter. It's pretty active. It's in Fort Collins. I don't know if there's anybody on the call who's connected to them. Um, it's an excellent organization and they're close to my heart because I, I was one of the of two or three of us that started the group back in the 90s um, out of Boulder, Colorado. And, and we, were tr we, we tried to make it so it would reach to Wyoming and we wanted to get it off the front range. And they still have a little bit of a challenge with that, but um, they're still an excellent group. And then of course the Native Plant Society and then and next, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. So here is how you get to the Colorado Wetland Information Center. You go on to the Colorado Natural Heritage Program website. And um, I'm hoping to make it maybe a little less tricky to get to some of our restoration and enhancement um, pages. But right now, you kind of have to go through working in wetlands, which is on the Colorado Wetland Information site and you click on restoration. And what ends up happening is you end up with, with a, a whole list of things that can really help you walk through exactly how you wanna think about doing a restoration project and just reminders of what to think about. So I'm gonna just quickly go through a little bit of that. So, um, and first I would like to just cover the 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 sort of the definition and rusty did a great job i'm not going to go into this too much but the re the, the uh, definition of uh, ecological restoration is something that has been focused on immensely over the years and a lot of people have tried to think it through and and try to you know put put it into words exactly what you're trying to accomplish without without sort of alienating anybody or any ideas and it's been a real challenge but Basically, the ass assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded and damaged or destroyed and sort of hoping that it can start at least providing some new ecological functions. I think that's kind of a good way to look at it. And um, I do um, I do want to encourage people to, if they're interested in that, to look at some of the history of that because it is kind of helpful in, in looking at going forward. But I think the main thing is, is that you just want to we do want to do something and we want to do it is with science it, as much as we possibly can informing where we're going. So again, so we, they cover site selection and prioritization on the website and you'll see this on the web page. This is, this is a great thing because it can, it, it, it will help you figure out your goals and your objectives. You know, what type of restoration are you hoping to accomplish? You know, what do you want to add just some willows and cottonwoods or do you want to try and um, go full out or do you have the funding to be able to try and use um, uh, potted plants and potted materials? Um, what, you know, what's feasible on your site? You need to look at hydrology, um, that kind of thing. And, that, and th it actually goes into, I'll go to the next one, um, when you're doing your site evaluation, you know, it talks a lot about hydrology and how you really want to think about your hydrology at your specific site. So, um, do you have do you have groundwater that's available um, and, and that's adjacent, or do you not? I mean, this could mean um, do you want to do your project or don't you? Because you may really have some real serious issues if you have some really tough hydrologic issues. You know, obviously we're we're dealing mostly always with um, altered um, hydrologic systems, and in the understanding exactly how that's going to impact your project is just key to moving forward. So, um, yeah, so hydrology is key to your long-term success. And then the other, so and then it goes even deeper into hydrology because hydrology is such a big deal, especially if if mo you're like most people and you do not have. Um, irrigation uh, available for your project for any length of time. Um, although I have worked on some projects where you actually have actually gotten drip to the project and that's 
pretty remarkable and that's a gold standard but and the other thing is is um you know do you know what your possibilities are we didn't even know on that on that particular project that we had the ability to do drip but it just kind of worked out over time that we actually did have that ability and we made it happen so um they always try to think big too so the other thing about um the uh, heritage programs website here is if we talk a lot about the climate change scenarios in colorado and i'm not going to go into that but there are you can you can go down some great rabbit holes on this website if you really want to dive into some topics and and um so i i just encourage you to do that oh that was not supposed to be the end <laughs> okay hold on a second okay okay so soil we also have a lot on soil and there there are actually six links that you can get to talking about soils so it reminds you that you need to think about your soils when you start thinking about what native plants you're, are going to be supported. Do you have um, saline issues? Uh, you know, what, what's going on with your soils? And um, do you have hydric soils? That might be something that's of, of interest to you as well. So again, you can go deep into your soil issues and, and this website will remind you and help you um, find out which aspects are going to be important to your your project then next i'm going to try and keep going pretty quickly here you know you went for the implementation so if you we also have sort of a checklist here and so you can look at when you're when you're making your list for your projects of your goals you need to start thinking about do you need any permits for example um, you might need them depending on the project so and what about erosion control are there issues with um, erosion and some of the soils that you're going to be moving around rusty of course covered weeds pretty darn well and then also wildlife issues you know are you going to have uh, canada geese come in and take out your project are you going to have deer coming in and browsing what about beaver all those kinds of things all those tricky tricky questions and so what's your plan how much money do you have potentially for for fencing um so you know on this implementation um part of the website this is just really helpful in making sure that you're not skipping anything and then lastly so eco when we start talking about the plan and you start getting into you know what is how am i going to think about my native plants and what what is appropriate for my site and a lot of that can be uh, addressed by using reference ecosystems and not always but you can go up or down from downstream from your site and you can try and see if you can find some areas that are less disturbed that's a really good place to start and then again on this website we've got a, a number of different links that you can connect to 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 look at different native plants. And then when you're selecting your plant materials, uh, you obviously, um, you've, got, you've got a number of issues. There's going to be availability issues, which is really sort of the number one issue. Um, so you, you can go ahead and make your plant list but you also need to make your plant list by uh, accessing some of the sites for some of the nurseries to understand what's available. So you have your wish list and then you have your reality list. And then that's another part of um, the reason why you wanna try and plan for as many years in advance as you possibly can, because you might be able to actually get a lot more on your wish list. And again, on um, on um, this uh, wetlands, the Colorado Wetland Information Center website, we have another um, some great resources. And then the, lastly, so why native? I think that you know that's another interesting discussion too. And I think that probably everyone on the call has a pretty good idea of that. But 
there are some different places that you can go to, to look into that a little bit more. So what you do is you end up drafting your plant list. Um, and again, with this, with this website, uh, and this is, can be very helpful because we also have some other parts of the website on the wetlands page where you can find some of the plant communities and we have plots that you can get to from that have been done over the years and those plots have associated plant lists with them. So if you're really kind of curious about whether or not the Heritage Program has done some plots in your area and um, what species they found, you can, you can get to that. And lastly, I want to call the Native Plant Society uh, website because again, this is another great resource and they're constantly working on this too. They have pictures, um, they have plant lists, it's, uh, it's a very sexy website and I want to encourage you to please um, utilize this site too if you're doing work in Colorado. And the NRCS, I don't know how many of you have utilized the seedling program, but this is also another great resource and it can be a lot less expensive to um, acquire stock if you go through this program. There are some conditions for utilizing this, but um, it's another great resource and it's interesting to see what they do supply. So lastly, just really briefly, I just want to say that this is on our website too, this adaptive management cycle. And this is another thing that is just very helpful and is trying to guide you through, you know, how you can do some, some adjustment as you go along. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I think we'll, we may have some time for questions. I'll let Kara and Rusty and everybody decide on that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, that was a great presentation and thanks to Rusty as well. Um, hopefully that was helpful to everyone and you got some good ideas and some online resources to help you with your restoration projects. Uh, we do have a couple minutes. If anyone does have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will read them out loud to our presenters. Um, so I'll just give everyone a couple minutes if you do have questions. And Kara also uh, put quite a few different uh, links to the different resources that were mentioned uh, throughout the two presentations in the chat box. So if you'd like to uh, copy and paste any of those, those are all available as well. <clears throat> And, and uh, just a reminder that the presentation is being recorded and uh, it'll be linked to our website. Is, is that correct, Kara? Yep, that's right. Okay, uh, two questions. Number one and number two, invasive species, according to USGS 2010, cited in Rusty's presentation. Um, the number one and two, um, so the, uh, the three and the four aren't just invasive species, so those are uh, three and four most prevalent plants along our rivers in the west, and, and so that takes into account native and non-native. Um, I, I can't, I do remember reading that uh, the USGS report, and, and I believe Cottonwood and, and Willow are, are at least one top five. I think they may be one and two, but I think the, the concerning part is that, you know, three and four uh, most prevalent plants along our rivers in the West are, are invasive species. So I think it just points to uh, the, the larger problem of rivers in our West and invasive species. I hope that helps. How are you all getting creative with regards to stewardship and volunteer portions of grant requirements? Um, uh, during, let me, and during COVID-19 times, follow up. Oh, um, I can take a, a shot at that if you want, and, I'll, and Lisa, uh, unless you wanted to. Um, yeah, go ahead, I might, maybe I'll add something, yeah. Mm 
Um, well, I think uh, some of the ways that we've looked at is 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 what what resources are out there. Um, you know, I, I think on on very very remote stretches of rivers, it, it's going to be very different than maybe a, a more urban setting uh, where you have access to lots of user groups, youth, um, volunteerism. Um, you know, what we've started to do is. We've looked at utilizing uh, youth cores where the prototypical youth core uh, kind of crew is a, a crew of six to eight with chainsaws or sprayers to do restoration. Well, we've looked at we've looked at using smaller groups of these young adults where we can engage them in other facets of, of restoration, like like monitoring, using um, using tablets to record. Uh, to do vegetative vegetation monitoring, and so we've we've really tried to get uh, a little more creative on how we can utilize the resources that that engage in these restoration uh, projects. Um, and and you know generally speaking, um, if we have a diversity of people engaged in a restoration project, it's, it definitely looks favorable on on. A, on a funding application, you know we've used uh, 4-H groups in in more agricultural settings where where they've uh, done a lot of projects for us. The COVID-19 thing really throws. I mean, it's just the monkey wrench in our in in, in our society as in general. Um, it, it, it's it's difficult. We had a volunteer event last weekend, and we had to have very very strict rules on on you know, uh, keeping our distance and, and bringing your own equipment, but we still were able to get people together, do social distancing. We were still able to engage you know, a, a dozen people uh, from the community on a, on a volunteer project. And, and so it can be done. It's just, it, we just have to look at how it's done safely. Uh, the whole COVID-19 thing, I don't know if we figured it out yet. I think we're kind of working our way through it like other people, but I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I have to agree, um, uh, Rusty. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> we are just figuring it out like everyone else is. But we did do, we still did do some volunteer programs. We didn't advertise the heritage program. Did not. We kind of did word of mouth with other organizations. We did some interesting things like bring your own lunch, which is a really rough thing to do. That was early on. Uh, we did end up altering that a little bit once we felt more comfortable, um, but we did somewhat work around it, but not entirely. We definitely had, um, and as you guys probably did, you know, we had to really let go a lot of our of our early planning to have big groups come out. Um, but yes, we and again, um, if it depended on sort of the, the, the how much people could be spread out and um, you know how safe people felt, and then there were also early on the requirements of how many people could get together. And now we kind of have we're back at that with ten people only being able to get together. So yeah, it's um, it's been a challenge, but I think that we're slowly working around that. Um, and Kara and Shannon, I don't know if you have anything to add on on the creative uh, ways we're we're looking at stewardship as well, or any other staff. Um. No, I think you covered it. You know, something that's been really important for us too is just uh, ongoing communication with our funders, and they've all been uh, fairly flexible in us being creative and, and thinking about ways to work around those issues. So, uh, great questions, Cassandra. Thanks for asking. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, we're happy to help you through any challenges or questions or follow up that you might have. Uh, I just wanted to thank Lisa again for taking the time to present with us. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of our local, state, federal partners, private landowners we work with. Uh, we couldn't do a lot of this work without the support of our uh, members and our donors. Uh, if you want to figure out um, or look into more ways to uh, support our organization, you can head over to our website. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, for joining us. Have a good rest of your day.